So today is June the 4th, 2014, and my name is Rochelle Ford, and I am interviewing Dr. Barbara Hines for the AEJMC Diversity Oral History Interview Project. Thank you, Dr. Hines, for agreeing to do this interview. Please know that it will be housed at the AEJMC Archives at Columbia, South Carolina, or at the Wisconsin Historical Society in Madison, Wisconsin. We will also post the interview on the internet. So, oh we will begin. <laughs> Let's first talk about your early years. Tell me about how you got interested in journalism. Well, as a young child, I loved to write. And wherever we were, I would write in journals. Uh, my father was military, so we did move around quite a bit. Um, I, we were encouraged to write. We were encouraged to read in my home Everyone read the newspaper, whether we would discuss things that were in the newspaper at dinner time. Um, I got very involved in journalism when I was in high school in both Texas and in Maryland. Um, I was interested in the business side to start out with and then evolved to the editorial side and became editor of my high school newspaper. Um, I think everybody has some stories about, you know, how they began, but my interest was um, forged really in, in the high school. Were there any particular news media that you consumed when you were in high school as you were thinking about journalism? Well, absolutely. Newspapers um, were king at the time. Uh, we, I can remember as a child when we got television, that will date me in my home, um, but it was a very small picture in, uh, in this seemingly cardboard box, but basically newspapers and magazines. I was a print person. When did you become aware of the need for diversity in the media? I actually um, noticed that at probably in college, um, working on the Daily Texan uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, that we did not have a lot of different voices. Um, there were a lot of people like me, um, blonde, Caucasian, uh, even though we're in Austin, Texas, and with a heavy Hispanic population, um, a good African-American uh, population. And I would hear people talking about, you know, different opinions and different views and I wondered why more people weren't interested because I thought everybody had the opportunities to participate uh, in the things that they were interested in and um, because I'd had a, a very diverse childhood um, and I grew up thinking that everyone had similar opportunities uh, and that really wasn't true. So you actually were able to practice journalism at some point. What kinds of stories did you report on, edit, and that you felt really helped the cause of diversity? Um, most of my early stories were neighborhood stories. Um, again, working at the Daily Texan. I was one of the four editors of the Daily Texan at the time. Um, it was broken up so that there was an editor every day because of, of the daily nature of the paper. Um, when I was writing, again, they, they were community stories and trying to show that there were things that everyone could participate in. Um, that weren't just things that were only open to one group or one class. I'm not so sure that at the time I realized that I was trying to consciously write about diversity. I don't know that I became more aware of that until uh, later in my career and probably that came when I was a public school teacher in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, um, and I started jumping over another a career, but um, where I was teaching high school journalism and speech at Parkdale High School in Prince George's County, and um, the Prince George's County schools 
um, were segregated to a great deal. Um, there was a major lawsuit and um, we had students who were being bused throughout the county by court order. Uh, it all happened fairly quickly. This was back in the 70s. And um, I realized then that the students who were coming into uh, the school hadn't had the kind of opportunities. And so I encouraged them, tried to get them to work on newspaper, um, tried to get them involved with the yearbook, um, tried to get them involved with our state scholastic press association so that they could go out and compete with students who were attending uh, majority white institutions um, or students who were attending the um, high performing public schools um, versus the, the public schools that they might have come from or represented. Um, so it wasn't a conscious effort, I, I don't think, until uh, I started teaching there and then as I migrated over to the University of Maryland at College Park. Um, I was recruited to teach there and after a year ended up becoming assistant dean of the College of Journalism. And as part of my duties, I worked um, to develop an internship program. And again, at that time, College Park was not very diverse. Um, and there was an organization started called um, the Task Force on Minorities in the News Business because colleges and universities around the country uh, were seeing that the media industry was not diverse. And so colleges and universities were looking at ways that they could partner with industry organizations and try to build um, a better representation of people who were working in the industry. And, um, there were things like the organizations like the Dow Jones Newspaper Fund, um, the American Newspaper Publishers Association. Uh, this was before NABJ and um, NAHJ, the, um, or the Native American or the Asian American Journalism Associations. And so there were lots of groups that came together to work to try to increase people of color in the news business. And not just people working in the business, but uh, the representation of a, a really rainbow community, um, being able to see that. And so I spent a lot of time working on that, and that sort of led to creating high school journalism workshops um, at College Park and working with organizations that did things um, for youth in the community. And I spent seven years there um, before Lee Barrow, who was dean here at the School of Communications, um, asked me if I would be interested in coming to teach at Howard. And I had been in administration at College Park and the notion of being able to go back in the classroom full time was very exciting. Um, and so I moved over to Howard University. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to teach uh, a full schedule, um, which I did for uh, a number of years, but then sort of gradually got back into administration. But as part of that, I was in a whole different environment. I was in an, an HBCU, um, and I didn't know what an HBCU was, quite frankly, as a blonde um, who had been educated in the South, um, really had had a very narrow um, education of understanding the different institutions um, that had been created. I was looking all at a certain niche, a certain kind of institution. Um, and the more that I was at the university and I, the more I, I saw what the vision was for HBCUs and the need for HBCUs, that sort of led me into other activities. Um, for 18 years, I ran the uh, Youth Leadership Academy at Howard, which was the um, summer journalism workshop, um, which 
evolved into a summer advertising workshop to include a summer advertising workshop. Uh, we were able to get grant funding from the Knight Foundation to have a program called the Knight Scholars where we brought students in to the university and gave them uh, financial assistance, gave them mentors, gave them programs to help ensure that they would be successful. And those programs um, sort of evolved into other, other things. Um, I had done a similar program, I had started a similar program at College Park with the Baltimore Sun and it was called the Baltimore Sun Papers Minority Scholars Program. And the Baltimore Sun was um, having great difficulty in getting... Uh, at College Park, we established a Baltimore Sun Papers Minority Scholars Program that went to Maryland high schools um, seeking minority students that were interested in journalism giving them a scholar scholarship to College Park, but also giving them an internship at the Baltimore Sun um, and some training opportunities so that when they graduated, they would be ready to go into the media business. Um, one of my proudest graduates of that program was Michelle Singletary, who is a syndicated columnist with the Washington Post, uh, Milton Kent, who was a longtime Baltimore Sun reporter and editor and who is now in journalism education at Morgan State uh, School of Global Journalism. Um, so it, is a, it was a program very similar to what other universities were doing, um, but it helped to ensure, it helped to push, it helped to get people thinking that maybe we needed to do a little bit more um, to ensure that people would have opportunities to get experience and get jobs that would lead to leadership positions. Because truly that's what we wanted to make sure is that you know, they wouldn't get lost um, in the crowd and that there would be opportunities uh, for the future. So you mentioned earlier that before you went into teaching um, scholastic journalism and speech that you also spent some other time on working in communications. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and were there any challenges or diversity um, there that you faced and maybe how you addressed those? I was young <laughs> and so probably didn't recognize some of the issues, but I had a wonderful job and a wonderful mentor. Um, I was the press secretary for Ralph Yarborough, who was the senior senator from Texas. Um, I actually got the job because I was working at the Daily Texan, and he, he had um, in his Austin office a woman who ran the office, Lenore Spiller, um, who read the Daily Texan and uh, talked to other people, and she called me one day and said, you know, there's going to be an opening in the Washington office. Um, and the senator wants to know if you'd be interested in, in talking about it. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I had a job offer um, when I was graduating to go to the Dallas Morning News to work as a reporter for their teen section. At that time, um, newspapers had sections oriented to teens to try to get them reading and interested. And um, it wasn't a firm job, but I had the opportunity to come to the Washington area um, and I had also done some student teaching and I, I finished my student teaching early in Texas and I said well you know let me let me try that and so I took a position working in um, Senator Yarbrough's office. Um, Senator Yarbrough was from East Texas, uh, he was a lawyer, uh, very high on education, um, very interested in making sure, we had similar views, making sure that people had voice. And he was a wonderful man. He and his wife um, lived right down near the Senate office building. And they sort of took me under their wing because I came up to Washington. Um, I didn't have um, a lot of resources here, at, although I'd lived here at one point in time. And so I started working for the senator and 
Um, because I was new in town, I was willing to work as long as I needed to work. Um, and he used to introduce me to people as his one woman army. And it became a joke among us because I, I would work seven o'clock in the morning till midnight if I needed to, uh, because the Senate would often, often be in session and um, late into the evening, or he would be out um, talking to community groups and you know, he would bring something, someone into the office like um, to introduce Cesar Chavez to me. And they were, you know, were both paddling around. They didn't have shoes on because it had been a long day. They'd been out marching for something. And um, so I got to know a, a young Ted Kennedy. Um, you know, people who had very similar ideas. Um, J. William Fulbright, names who are in, in our history now. Um, I got to know and got to know the kinds of things they believed in. And Yarborough, uh, health, education, welfare, um, and the environment were the issues that he most supported. Um, I worked for him. I wrote all of his statements that he would present in the Senate. I ghosted articles for him, any magazine article that you saw that said it was by Senator Ralph Yarborough really was by Barbara Beeler Hines. Uh, at that time, I was not married. Um, and so I got to write, and I got to continue my interest in news, um, I, and history, and politics, um, and it was a great time. Um, he was the one who had encouraged me to get a master's degree. Um, and he encouraged me to go on with my education. Uh, at the same time, I was um, dating someone I had met in high school, and actually he had been uh, instrumental in me becoming editor of the high school newspaper. He was a year ahead of me, but he was a sports editor. And um, so he was here in the Washington area, so that was another reason for me to make the move back. And uh, eventually we, meet, we married. Um, he, used, he knew where I was pretty much at all times because my parking lot was right, my parking space was right outside the old Senate office building. And uh, he would drive by from work uh, and see my car. And so he would know where I was. Um, but I worked there and then I was offered an opportunity to go to Prince George's County and teach. And at the same time, there was a nasty reelection. Um, Senator Yarborough served 12 years in the Senate. Um, he was defeated by Lloyd Benson, who went on to become the Treasury Secretary. Um, it was a very nasty campaign. Yarborough was a liberal Democrat, and at the time, liberal Democrats were being blamed for Vietnam. And so um, he lost the election to Lloyd Benson. And at that time, I was also offered um, a position. So I continued to work on Capitol Hill for the senator uh, until the very last day he was there. But I had also started teaching out in Prince George's County. So my schedule was that I would be at Parkdale from 6.30 in the morning till 2.30. And then I would be on Capitol Hill from 3 until midnight. Um, and I did that because um, the Yarboroughs were such good people, um, and he was, he had a very special mission, and I actually was the, his last employee um, because everyone else in the office, you know, looked for other jobs, and um, with the change on Capitol Hill, you know, as soon as they found something, they would leave, and so I actually was the last one out the door packing them up to leave, and then I could have just one job. I was back teaching uh, full-time, so that was sort of in between. Um, and throughout my jobs, <clears throat> excuse me, I got um, very involved with people in the media, and so I had a lot of opportunities to uh, expand my interest in public relations. I ended up, uh, while I was uh, teaching, I got my master's degree at American University. At that time, I was married. My husband was employed at American University, um, so I was able to get my degree while I was there. Um, 
I never dreamed that I would end up getting a PhD. When I went to College Park, um, I had I watched people getting PhDs. I was assistant dean of the College of Journalism, and I was working with all these PhDs. And I thought, well, I should use my tuition remission as an employee and get my PhD. So um, I did that, and throughout that experience, you know, met more people in higher education, in media. Um, I became very involved working with the um, Maryland-Delaware DC Press Association. Um, with the internship program at College Park, I became uh, more involved in working with people in the Washington public relations community. Um, so all of the jobs had given me many opportunities to diversify and um, by diversifying the kind of job I was doing, it widened my opportunity to meet people um, from all over the globe. So it's not something I consciously sought out or there wasn't one event that um, sort of pushed me in the direction to try to be sure that others had the kind of opportunities that I did, but just happened, and uh, I've been very lucky. So, in working at Howard University, which is an HBCU, mm -hmm. um, somewhat of a pioneer, too, to be a Caucasian woman at an <laughs> HBCU, describe what that experience was like, where you were kind of minority um, among a minority organization. Well, you know, I guess it was the way I was raised. Um, I didn't know I was a minority. Um, when I came to Howard University, um, there were other others um, from all walks of life. There weren't a lot of us, but I don't think I realized it until one day uh, in one of my classes, the first, first semester of one of my classes, a student sort of looked at me and said, so you're the teacher? And uh, he said, what are you doing here? And I didn't know what he meant. And I said, well, what do you mean? I said, you know, this is the class I was assigned. It was a communications class. Um, and uh, this is my job. <laughs> you know, I'm a faculty member. And he said, well, why would you want to come and teach with all these black people? And I said, well, why wouldn't I? If I love teaching and I love people, what does it matter what color you are? Um, aren't we all looking to improve, you know, what we're learning and what we're doing? And he said, but, you know, there aren't a lot of you around. I said, well, I'm new, so I haven't had a chance to figure that out yet. I said, so when I go up, you know, on campus more, I'll look around and see. But um, quite frankly, I had the opportunity to come and to teach and um, to work with a lot of different people. Um, I will also tell you that at that time, and this was back in um, the late 70s, the College Park campus was not um, especially welcoming to women. And um, it was predominantly white males who were in leadership positions, um, who were uh, in dean positions, who were senior faculty. Uh, there weren't a lot of women who were junior faculty. Uh, there didn't seem to be a lot of opportunities. As a matter of fact, I had one uh, dean tell me that I should stay in administration because I probably would never get tenure as a faculty member. And I thought, well, that's a strange thing to say to someone. Um, how do you know that? Um, it was someone that I had not known very long. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'll show you. <laughs> um, because, again, it was that mindset that not everybody had the same opportunities. Um, it was an, an interesting footnote, two years after I left College Park, 
There was a class action lawsuit, women faculty at the University of Maryland against the university uh, about issues of tenure and promotion, about collegiality, about the workplace. Um, and so it wasn't something that people talked about a lot, but I, I experienced it. Uh, not so much that I wanted to run from the campus. I loved College Park. But then when I had an opportunity to do something different and to go back to teaching, um, I was just enamored by the opportunity to be able to come to Howard University in Washington, D.C. And it was only seven miles farther from where I was living. Um, so I thought, great, great opportunity. So when you think about your teaching um, and trying to incorporate issues of gender and race and international or um, you know, GLBT you know, issues, how have you attempted to do that or, or even to promote that among other teachers? One of the things that I've tried to do is to push people to go outside of their comfort. Um, our students come to Howard and I would say the large majority of them are very comfortable um, because they come from um, a, a background, uh, an African-American background or our international students, a uh, great majority of them from Africa and um, they feel very comfortable. But I always try to encourage my students to look outside of the box and feel differently. Um, and it was interesting. Every once in a while I'd come, I'd have a student in a class who came from a predominantly white high school and came to Howard University and they struggled more at Howard University because they weren't used to the culture or they felt uncomfortable in the culture. And that was their, their going outside of the box experience. Um, I tried to encourage our students not to just look at Washington, D.C., but to broaden their perspective. If they had an opportunity to participate in an internship, whether it was in Iowa or Kansas or somewhere else, if it was overseas, to try to get involved in that. Um, I tried to push myself to be involved in as many organizations that I felt would benefit my students. Um, I loved meeting people. I loved getting out and um, always learning. And I felt like if I'm going to give my time, um, I want to make sure that there will be some return for my students. So even with our young faculty, I say find an organization that will find, provide some mentoring for you, but may provide an opportunity for you to attend a conference somewhere where you've never been before, where you'll have an opportunity to meet people who aren't researching the same things that you are, that have different perspectives, because that's how you're going to grow. You never know what experience you will come back with. So when you think about, as you started early from high school students, then mm -hmm. to college students, undergraduates in particular, mm -hmm. then you moved on to emphasize graduate education. <laughs> And that's a whole different set of diversity issues and really trying to push the research agenda. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that um, you've seen um, from your students, the things that you've tried to embed in them as scholars as well? It's interesting. Um, again, I didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, I remember going home and telling my husband, you know, I've been asked to work more closely with the graduate program and to help develop the graduate program. And I said, boy, it's going to be different working with adults. I said, you know, this is exciting, you know, another opportunity. And I had no clue that the adult older population um, would have so many challenges that they would be dealing with that were oftentimes very different from the challenges that undergraduates had. But I also found 
that many of them were set in their ways and were not open to thinking about things differently. And so I was very excited when the graduate school started a partnership um, with some universities outside of the United States. Uh, and we had the opportunity for some of our students to travel to Brazil um, or to travel to Spain to do some studying there and to be able to come back and talk to their classmates about the opportunity to meet people. Um, I applied the same things. I encouraged our students. Uh, you know, it's the blessing of Howard University of being in Washington, D.C. I say it's the blessing and the curse. There are so many opportunities um, that our students get overwhelmed with opportunities. And you have to be willing to set some parameters for your life, for your education, and for opportunities. Um, and you have to balance those things. And um, we would have incredible opportunities for students to go to the White House or Capitol Hill or world leaders coming to campus to present their credentials to the president of the university who wanted to meet graduate students and or they wanted to speak to graduate classes and you wanted to make sure that they picked the right opportunities um, and could balance their time and, and could look at those as things that would be springboards to their research interests, that would complement their research interests. One of the things that you, you mentioned was that you've been involved in so many different professional and scholastic and higher education you know, associations and groups. Um, and you've been elected president of several of those and have mm -hmm. led diversity initiatives and, and others and have received recognition for your, your work in diversity. Can you tell me a little bit about the agendas that you had um, in some of the leadership roles, particularly like with AUJMC um, as president, but then also um, the work that you really um, promoted within the Public Relations Society of America too? Let me start with um, PRSA, Public Relations Society of America, because you know one of the um, the things that I, I enjoyed the most was being very involved in um, the diversity efforts of PRSA, and it uh, went back to being a committee of the organization and getting to work with people who were out there in um, nonprofits and Fortune 500 companies, you know, who had this commitment to diversifying the workforce, to doing what they did in their industry better, uh, and being more aware. And it was, it was so much fun to be able to work with them and be invited to their companies and to talk to their employees um, and to help them in, in a lot of different ways. And, uh, one of my earliest memories is of having the opportunity of being able to do a workshop for a public relations in firm here in Washington that was Paluzic and Leslie Associates. Um, and it just so happened that one of my former high school students uh, went to work for Paluzic and Leslie and um, they wanted to do some training for their staff. and. At that point, I was at College Park, and um, I did some, some outreach and some training and trying to get them to look at things differently and how they wrote, um, at that time, the press releases, the annual reports, the things that they were doing um, to, to ensure that you know, they, they really had um, looked at things with a wide lens. And, I love the fact that Paluzic and Leslie, uh, John Paluzic, uh, went on to sell his firm and Ketchum Communications is um, the firm that he was with for so long and um, has gone on uh, to be a major voice in the public relations industry. Um, and 
He is now working with the accrediting council. It's sort of this big circle of people that, you know, you worked with many, many years ago, um, but you share a vision with. And um, in AEJMC, uh, AEJMC has a minorities uh, and communications division. It has a commission on the status of minorities. It has a commission on the status of women. So it's an organization that is truly committed um, to equality and opportunities. Um, and when I was in, involved, and I'm still involved uh, in those organizations, I've tried to um, not talk a lot, but tried to be there and maybe ask questions um, to let other people do more of the talking and let other people um, provide more of uh, the outreach, but to sort of work behind the scenes and ask the questions, you know, are we doing this the right way? Are we ensuring that everyone has an opportunity? Um, when we start a new program, uh, looking at how the program is developed um, and being sure that the requirements for it um, aren't skewed, don't skew to one particular ethnic group or gender, um, to try to, try to do it quietly and uh, maybe without people knowing it. Um, I don't consider myself a, a, a leader in any special initiatives, um, but just sort of a good soldier, you know, working for the organizations. So given today's changing news media environment or public communication environment, because so much of communication is direct to consumer and doesn't have to be mediated through mm -hmm. um, news organizations, what importance do you feel is um, do you feel is being put on diversity? What level of importance? I really share a concern about it now. I think we were doing great things in the '70s and '80s and the 90s and as we get into the 2000s, um, I am concerned because of what so much of what is happening in our society. We are becoming so much more um, a product of technology. Um, I worry that people don't spend as much time talking and um, using critical thinking as they plan things out. I see this whole evolution of the tech industry uh, and certainly the reports out just last week of the percentage of, of women and minorities um, that are in the tech world are abysmal. And I see that and I don't see a lot of programs helping to ensure. There's a push with STEM um, to increase the number of women and minorities. Uh, in the science and technology, but I don't know that it's a real popular effort at this point. I see a, a lot of from the science side, but from the communication side and the evolving technology side, um, I worry about that. I see that our, because of the changes in the journalism industry, I see what's happening with our uh, National Association of Black Journalists, our National Association of Hispanic Journalists. They are struggling uh, because the industry is struggling. They were so news focused, news centric um, and broadcast centric. And as we evolve and we see these new organizations, um, the online news organizations and other organizations that are um, being driven by technology, I worry about the opportunities um, for people in a purely communications industry. Um, I worry that our young people are able to talk to one another. They would much prefer to text someone. Uh, they can be sitting in a room uh, with a friend and they would rather text that friend than have a conversation. 
Um, and that really concerns me as someone who came up, you know, from Capitol Hill seeing people talk and argue and negotiate and go back and forth and working in, in advertising and public relations and working with people in newsrooms, doing training sessions. Um, you've got to understand how people think and what they believe and what's in here. And you don't get that from just texting. I have students when I'm teaching a, a, a writing course and I say, well, you know, you've got to go out and get the information. Um, and they'll just want to go to the web to find it. I say, you need to call and find it. Or do you know what a library is? L-I-B-R-A-R-Y. Have you been in a library recently? There is still incredible resource information, but you have to go and find it. You can't just sit down in front of a computer. I find it even as a supervisor working with staff here at the university um, that it's very easy for them to simply email someone to ask a question um, rather than um, doing management by walking, going to another office, talking to people, picking up a telephone, uh, being persistent about getting information. So I worry that that's going to affect our society and uh, I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity. I don't know the answer yet of how to ensure that as we, as our world becomes so much more um, technologically oriented. But I know in my heart that we've still got to be able to talk and reason and think quickly on our feet uh, and be able to write so that people understand that's never going to go away. And we've got to be able to do it well. I think we're going to end on that note. So thank you. For your well, time. thank you very much. Appreciate it.